I'm here at Todd A.O. Hollywood to chat with sound designer Mark Mangini and hear what he has to say. Okay, so here we are with Mark. I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Yeah, this is cool. How did you get your start? Well, it was really an accident. I mean, do you want to hear the like the, the sort of accident story? I want to hear how you got started. <laughs> I know that's what you just asked. I was watching the Oscars. I was a foreign language major in college, which may we maybe we'll talk about later because it affected my ability to sort of create languages and voices for creatures, which I do a lot of. But I was in college and I saw the Oscars in 1973 or four, and realized I really wanted to be in the movie business. So I dropped out of college drove to Los Angeles with the intention of getting into the movie business somehow. And the first gig I got was at Hanna-Barbera Studios. It was completely fortuitous. I, I knew a friend of a friend of a friend, got me an interview, and I got into the sound department at Hanna-Barbera cutting cartoon sound effects. But it, I, that, I did not deign to be a sound effects editor. I didn't even know that sound editors, designers, mixers even existed. I would go to the movies and just accept sound for what it was. But it was my first foothold in the industry, and I thought, I'll take anything. So I took a job as a sound editor in cartoons. Now, cutting. This is not cutting as we know cutting today. This is actually with a razor, correct? And slicing up... Uh, well, yeah, this is, this is, you know, this is antediluvian, uh, steam-powered, <laughs> sprocket-driven belts and gears and cogs on a device called a moviola. Yeah, nobody uses them anymore. It's real physical, yeah, the equivalent of, you know, glue and tape and splicing and cutting and film, you know, rolls and spools of film. Yeah. So you get started. Sound you can touch. So, well, there you I don't go. know if that has value. Probably sound you could smell at that point <laughs> with all the acting. Um, so, you know, you get started. I mean, what are some of the things that you're exposed to at Hanna-Barbera? We're talking lots of cartoons and good stuff like that. That's pretty fun experimenting, right? For me, and when students ask me what's great training to be a sound designer, and maybe we'll talk about whatever that means, sound designer, um, cartoons were the greatest training for a sound designer because it taught you that the action you, that you saw on screen did not have to be mirrored in sound that matched it. You could, you could use uh, metaphorical sound. So when, you know, uh, Dean, when Fred Flintstone rolls a ball and hits a bunch of people, they all fall down like bowling pins, not body falls. Or you hit somebody on the head, you don't hear, you don't hear that, you'd hear a pan clang or a, some birds twittering. You know, you extrapolate what, what the sound would be. And those, those are the sort of the fundamentals of sound design, of extrapolating what sound could be, not what sound should be. So I thought that cartoons was, for me, was, was the best training ground I could have had for becoming a sound designer. Because it forced me to think metaphorically. Now, you went on to work on some pretty big films. How did that experience of metaphorical thinking for sound translate into movies like Spiderwick Chronicles or Fifth Element? Well, that's a big leap. <laughs> that's a 25-year <laughs> leap. We don't yeah, have we enough can, take we for that. We can cut this out and then, <laughs> and then rearrange it. Yeah. I, I mean, do you want to know literally how my career path went? Is that the no, question? No, I'm just thinking of how th that mindset translated of thinking metaphorically with sound. Does that translate when you're doing realistic films? That's a good question. Um, it, it's if, if, when I'm doing realistic film, meaning some films that don't have creatures and spaceships and, and those kinds of things. It's interesting because I think r realistic films, dramatic film, well, all films are dramatic. Realistic films with realistic sound are the hardest films to do. For some reason, for me, the the Fifth Element and the Star Treks and the the Spiderwick Chronicles are a lot easier for me because I have. I have an active imagination, so when I see a visual effect, you know, a CGI shot, my mind immediately goes to, or my mind's ear goes to, well, I know what I think I want that to sound like, and I, start, I get to play. And nobody can tell you, oh, it shouldn't sound like that. Who are you to say what, what that creature should sound like, or that, you know, whatever. So those, to me, those kinds of films are easier than realism. To me, creating verisimilitude is so much harder because we all live in that real world, we have an expectation of what that should sound like. Now, the onus on the sound designer is to understand that and then take it to sort of this other place of, I'm tricking you into thinking this is reality. Ultimately, that's what sound design is as well, 
creating things we haven't heard before, making you think that that creature could really sound like that. But it's a lot harder to do it in reality, to place the audience in a sonic environment that feels like they belong there, and tricking them into thinking this all happened in real time with sound, not the little bits and pieces of splicing that occurs to create montage. So you've been doing this for a long time. What's, uh, what's the most fun you've had on a project? I've had, I've had so many great projects, it's embarrassing to even talk about. Um, there's no one favorite. I have three favorites that come to mind. Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Fifth Element, and The Green Mile. Um, one of the unifying themes with all three of those projects were that the filmmakers recognized the value, that the, the contribution that sound made, and they gave me or us a great deal of time to pursue sound. On all of those projects, I was on for at least seven to eight months. Um, and it made a difference in the quality of the sound for those films. I, I think the f just jumping ahead by 1% is the fifth element because Luc Besson, the, the director, to me became and embodied everything that I thought a, f a French filmmaker would be, which was a passionate artist who respected and admired the contribution that all the other contributors made to their projects. So Luc, unlike most other maybe Hollywood filmmakers, didn't micromanage me. I spotted the film with him, and then he let me go, and we didn't talk for months. I th we checked in. In fact, we had one sound design review session. He, we sh looked at the film together. We talked a little about concept. You know, what do you, what, do you, what do you want the movie to sound like? And then I went off, and I started making the first batch of sounds. In this case, it was the air cars for The Fifth Element. I brought them to him one afternoon and played, like, the first three sounds, and he, he said, I can't do it. I'll, I'll do a bad French accent. He said, that, that's very good. Thank you. And that was the last time I saw him till the final mix. Completely trusted me to prepare this huge space epic with all the sound, creature voices and, and, and vehicles and atmospheres and aliens. And he didn't need to hear all of that. He just felt like, okay, I've, I know I've hired a guy I can trust. And he did that in every department. And that was so refreshing. That felt so good. And that, that, so that, that was one aspect of the, of the movie that made it great. It was also the challenge of all those great, unusual sound. Getting to make fun, never-before-heard sounds makes a film really enriching. And the fact that the cutting room was in this huge beach house in Malibu, right on the beach. And I would go visit the film editor, Sylvie Landra, probably once a week, and just to talk to her and play her sounds, and, so, and I could feed her things to put in the Avid. So, you know, I'd show up at 11, and we'd drink wine, and we'd eat on the beach, and then they'd make us lunch, and then we'd look at a little film. This is a hard day work for me. <laughs> Holy smokes. I'm painting a really bad picture, because <laughs> yeah, exactly. this will never have jinxed It's it. grueling work. <laughs> <laughs> so that made it really great as well. What's your Mount Everest? What's the, um, is there a sound film uh, that you're, you're after that you haven't been handed yet? Something that you've yeah. always wanted to do? Forbidden what? Planet. Forbidden Planet. And, and Darabont keeps saying he's going to remake it. He's been saying this for 10 years. He's owned the rights on and off for some time. And there was, it was said about two years, three years ago in the trades, they said Frank was going to do it. And I have dinner with him tonight, in fact, and I'm going to ask him about it. I think he, it's, he's already lost and the rights to it. And it's, it's maybe the, they've moved on to another filmmaker. But that, to me, was one of the great synergies of sound design and musique concrète. Uh, all the, the, the work that uh, B.B. and Louis Barron did with these analog circuits that, you know, the, it, when you watch that film, when you listen to that film, you don't know if, is it sound effects? Is it music? What is it? Whatever it is, it's all working on one level dramatically to make that planet and the id monster and everything else that that sound score, design, whatever it is, does. It all works on this one level because it came from the the creativity of one person, or two people, this, this husband and wife team of B.B. and Louis Barron. And to me, that's the ultimate Everest, is to be given that challenge of, Mark, I want you to create the sound of this film however you do it. And I, being a musician as well, I have that skill set to rise to that challenge. And if it means doing things musically, I have that skill set. If, if it means that we don't want to go musical, I can do that too. I want, I want that film, and, and Forbidden Planet was the classic. Do you think that as a musician, uh, your experience with music helps you as a sound designer? Oh, absolutely, because um, as a musician, you're always thinking of, of structure. 
you know, you, you, have, you want to think of beginning, middle, and end, dynamics, um, frequency, you know, high, mids, and lows, all the, all the components that go into writing a really listenable piece of music also go into the creation of good soundtracks on the macro and the micro level and, and, and on the sort of the global level of let's look at a film as a composition as a, you could look at it as a song or as a, as, a, as, a, um, as a symphony you can break it down into movements or even a song you know you want to state the verse and have the chorus and then you have to have a breakdown and you have to have this middle section a film, all great s pieces of music have to have dynamics. It can't all be all loud and it can't, doesn't want to be all soft. You, you want to build in all those dynamics and, and you should approach a sound s score, if you will, for a film the same way. You want to build in all those elements. So b having some fundamental, in training, some fundamental training in music I think is super valuable so you can build that in. Because otherwise the, 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 brain, the, e the brain, the ear tires quickly if you only have one if if you don't have a musical approach take one